Their answers are... <laughs> Woo! You're at the third round of interviews. Their answers are music to your ears. The negotiation goes smoothly. And the next thing you know, the sweet talk is over and they start on Monday. Now what? This is the Culture Clinic, where my co-founder Skay and I are constantly learning from HR experts on how to build a culture where people love to work. My name is Joe, I am a co-founder here at Gusto, and today we're joined by Kwesi Thomas, an HR expert in rewards and recognition. Kwesi, let's get into this week's topic. Let's do it. The topic today, the honeymoon is over, we got our candidate, now what? So Kwesi, have you ever regretted taking a job? If so, why? Yes. Um... What I was in high tech for about 14, 15 years, my, my start of my career, and I took a job at a financial institution downtown Toronto, you know, a uh, job my parents were really proud of. I had to buy a whole bunch of suits and shirts and ties because at high tech, I wore none of those things, you know, and off I went, made the commute and took the go train with everyone else, went downtown and it just didn't match the culture that I was, I wanted to work in. It had nothing to do with the job or the people around me. It just was a completely different work culture than I had been used to and I was looking for. Um, and that was, it was hard. It was a hard time. I actually left pretty quickly after joining um, just for to go back to high tech. Um, not an easy decision, not something I wanted to do uh, in terms of going there for a short period of time. But, um, you know, during that honeymoon period, I thought it was going to be great. I'm going to be downtown. I'm going to be in the hustle and bustle, you know, do all that other good stuff. And then when I got into that, that role, I just was not right for me. Um, primarily because of the work culture, the work style, not because of anything else. In reflection, do you think it was a failure on the company's part or a failure on your part to sort of like better understand the culture going in? I would say largely mine and part and, and to smaller extent the company. Mine because I think uh, I didn't recognize or know what I was what I was changing in terms of work styles or work culture. I didn't know and I thought maybe that was the next step that you're naturally supposed to take in your career. And so I almost did what I thought was you're supposed to do, right? Because that was on me. On the company side, I think um, understanding the, the type of work I had done and, and sort of at the pace and, and, and that through the interview, I think that was very evident. Looking back, I think it was a bit of a mismatch when I got in there and then I was being asked to write memos, you know? And I was like, I, I haven't written a memo ever. I, you want a PowerPoint? Sure. Uh, <laughs> you want me to write an actual four-page memo on, on, on the change of a reward philosophy? It's not something I had even seen or thought about. So the pace and the style of work was completely different than I was used to. Yeah, writing memos uh, makes me think of uh, TPS reports uh, in office space. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, I, I, and, and at that time, I was, you know, just the late, like even just the layers, I was not used to what I was walking into. I was, I was a VP with four or five people between me and the CEO. And so I was writing a memo that was getting edited by another VP, edited by a SEVP, and an SVP and a COO. And I was just like, this is, I just wasn't used to that work style. And that was probably on me not recognizing it, but it was a different style. Something that we've done here internally at Gusto to try and help sort of match our culture with a candidate is to weave our core values into the hiring process. We're try, we try to be very overt in the job description around what our values are so that people at the outset sort of like know that. And then we also weave questions uh, into the interview process that really tries to tease out uh, whether there's going to be a good value alignment. Do you think that a strategy like that would have been helpful in your situation? Yeah, a thousand percent. I think that is, that's the right way to do interviews. Um, for me, the, the sort of typical, let's talk to each other for an hour, maybe once or twice more as we talk to people up the ladder that somebody else is going to call you and make you an offer. I just think that is the wrong way to hire people uh, now. I think getting people exposed to the company and the team and the culture they're going to work with, as well as you as the employer getting exposed to more of an hour's worth of best behavior personality and personality you can get is is just a uh, it's kind of an antiquated way to, to, to match. My grandmother used to tell me, come see me and come live with me are two different things. When you come to see me, it's all nice and rosy. You got to come and live with me, that's a whole different thing. And so the more you can get closer to understanding what's like to live, work with that person, the better. Yeah, grandma's not giving you chores when you're coming over for lunch, you know? Right. <laughs> you're getting the best. Everybody's dressed well and talking nicely and everybody's behaving well. <laughs> right? 
I think you give a great example of, of sort of a, an experience in your life of taking a job and then realizing quickly that it, that it wasn't a good a good fit, and that was really based on, you know, a lack of culture fit. So, in your perspective, what are the most common reasons a new hire doesn't work out? Culture fit's going to be high up there, but I, often I think we 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 don't dig into the in the interview enough to understand how people work. We understand what they've accomplished in their use. We talk about what have you done? Oh, you've done that project. You've done that work. You've done, you've done that. You know, accomplish this. And we don't talk a lot about how they work enough. How did you? How do you communicate? How did you um, respond to the challenges? How did you deal with the pressure of the stress when something got intense? How did you navigate that? You know, approval that was hard to get. Those are the to me the more important. Like the hows are kind of almost as or if not sometimes more important than the what. And we do a very good job of interviewing for what. And so, um, for me that, uh, you know, in, in, in large ways, when people get into jobs, how they work is the challenge. It's not what they have to do. It's how they work, how they communicate, how they email, how they don't check their calendar, how they don't, you know, um, get approvals that they need to get. And it's those things that are often more challenging in the job than, than what they have to do. And I think for me, that's, that's one of the big one why, why people fail in roles. So I want to talk just for a second about the difference between culture fit and culture add, because we hear a lot of times we're looking for culture fit. However, there's sort of a, a new way of approaching this, which is culture add, and it's just slightly different. So uh, can you just talk about the nuance ar around those those kind of like two definitions and how we might want to think about that when we're looking to add someone to our team that would add to our culture versus just fitting with the culture? Yeah, uh, we often don't use the word culture add enough, and I think that's probably... The more the more accurate description of what we're trying to do, which is find someone that who's going to not fit into the current culture, just you know, be another same cog and same wheel that does the same thing. We're often we're looking for someone who's going to add and offer something that helps, you know, improve or um, make things go faster or make things you know challenge the team. And so often we're looking for someone who's going to add, who's going to add to your culture, right? Um, uh, the, you know, funny enough, when we were at Shopify, the person was head of record, re recruiting. Did a really good job of, of defining this. I don't know that we use those exact words, but he was looking for people who were going to bring other people, like help other people be better. And so I think the more we can focus on culture add, the better versus culture fit, right? Because oftentimes culture fit just means more of the same, which is not what we need in any of these companies. We need people who can add to it. And so how do you think diversity is part of this conversation and why it's important to be diverse in your hiring as a way to sort of add to your culture? Yeah, and 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 that diverse word, I would probably use it broadly as diverse in in not just um, the you know the, the traditional term use of that word, but diverse in thinking, diverse in backgrounds, diverse in cultures, etc. I think the more you can add to you know to the team that have that are able to challenge each other's work thoughts ideas in a positive way, but I would do that in a way that they can actually be productive. Is eventually powerful. So I think, you know, looking for diversity in the thought, in the, in the, in the approaches of the people on the team is, is great. Right. Um, quick example, I, you know, was working with a team in Singapore and there was a, literally a, a, like a rocket scientist was one of the engineers and he was like his, 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 his just his, his approach to thinking, he challenged a lot of people, but what he challenged them, it was because he had a different way of thinking about, about how we were approaching even culture. It's probably the person I spoke to a lot in the, in the on the team who asked me a lot about how we we're building the culture, because he approached it from a very scientific um, method, right? And so he read a lot. And he came and asked a lot of questions, but he was a culture add to me because he was though he was very different. He actually was helping push the culture of the company as, and other pieces by adding to it, not just being a part of it. So staying on this theme of common reasons that new hires don't work out, I want to get your perspective on. Almost like sell, like, okay, so let's say you identify a, a star candidate. Do you see this scenario happen often where the company is now selling themselves too hard to the point where it's almost a bait and switch, where they're painting a bit of a rosy picture of what it's like, and then all of a sudden someone takes the job and they realize like, well, it's nothing like that. Do you see that as being a common problem and uh, a driver for sort of like turnover at like quick turnover? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of, especially over the last few years, some of the, there's a lot of high tech companies, for example, competing for small pools of talent. And so there's a lot of selling what we are, what you can do, what you're going to be able to do. 
I'll see some of the larger companies that are trying to hire from the tech space, trying to also see it would be, you know, keep up. Yeah, we've got beer in the fridge and you can drink, you know, whatever, all those things that happen. And um, for some reason, I don't think they need to do that. I think often if you want a candidate, making them feel wanted, it has less to do with, you know, with, with exaggerating what they're going to be able to experience and more about making them feel wanted and that they're going to have a real opportunity to do the work that they want to do. Uh, but so I'm kind of not answering your question, but answering and saying, have seen more of it happen, but I think the right thing to do is focus on what they are going to do and do more of it. I think the, for me, whenever I've had candidates who wanted, I made them know that they're wanted. Uh, we weren't waiting, you know, three weeks to call them back. We were making, we were going to say, Hey, this was a great interview <laughs> and let's talk to you tomorrow and let's make them feel, let's actually put them into a process that makes them feel wanted. Right. Mm. Um, oftentimes, even if you get colleagues, et cetera, who are just talking to them about their experience, not as another interview, but just sharing with them so they understand what they're walking into. Um, um, you know, for me, my when I joined Shopify, I, I joined for this for this reason. They made me feel wanted. I knew they wanted me to work there, and I wanted to work there. Like it was, it was very quickly. Um, uh, uh, it was a very interesting day. I, I met and I sat with so many people, and they weren't interviews. I had lunch with the team that I was going to lead. I had um, like not as their potential leader. I just had lunch with them. Right. Um, then met some of the leaders. We just had conversation. I think, you know, the more you can make people feel wanted, the more that they will commit to the company, regardless of all the other song and dance you can do. I totally avoided your questions about bait and switch. <laughs> so if you really want a candidate, stop playing hard to get. Stop playing hard to get. The grandma didn't tell me that one, but that was just one from learning. <laughs> if you want a candidate, stop playing hard to get. Go get the candidate. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> okay, so... What tips can you offer to employers for making the first few months of an employee's tenure a success? Set realistic expectations. I, I keep talking about communications, but I think if people understand what you want from them in those few months, first few months, it's it's important because for the candidate coming in, they're trying to impress and they're trying to you know establish that hey, at least hopefully they keep me. And if you've got those wonderful um, you know three month clauses in your contract that lets you come out, you know those then they're nervous. And so the more you can tell them about what to expect, what to do, and, 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 and recognize the work that they're doing well, um, and also, you know, um, feedback on work that's not going well, the more they're going to get, get, they're going to get comfortable with the work they're doing. So I think feedback, positive and negative is really important in the first few, in the first little while. Um, I think exposing the person, so to exposing that person to the broader group and letting the person understand the other people they're working with, I think it also makes it a, a very important. Uh, to connect. I think connection is very important. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah, I agree. Connection, I think, is super important during the onboarding phase. There's a few things that come to mind that we've done here internally that have been really successful. Th you know, just things like buddy programs, right? So assigning somebody a mentor. You know, if I have questions, I know I can go to that person and just ask questions. Maybe it's a coffee program where you're picking up the tab for coffee, even virtual coffee, so that uh, people can connect with colleagues and peers over a, a quick coffee uh, over the course of the first first few weeks. And then, you know, something else that I think of that I think often gets overlooked is, you know, how are we hard coding appreciation and recognition into the first 90 days? So a lot of companies think about running a well-executed anniversary award program, right? Like, hey, year one, five, 10, 15, we're making sure to give recognition. Like that same thought pattern, that same approach, I believe needs to be hard-coded into the first 90 days. Like are people receiving recognition during week one, month one, month three, like at minimum, right? We should be hard-coding that uh, in, into, into the onboarding phase. Um, and I, I think that's paramount to sort of making people feel comfortable during, you know, during the kickoff of their new role. Yeah. I think you're, you're bang on there. They, they don't have to be huge programs. Sometimes months one might be, or week one might just be recognizing the person's joined in the team and how excited that it, that is to a broader group, whether that's the department, the whole company, et cetera. Sometimes I know Shopify, I think it was month three, at the end of month three, you got uh, like a gift certificate to go to dinner, right? Like they were just like, Probation's over. Congratulations, <laughs> right? But I, I think the, you're you're bang on, Joe. During those first three months, um, set the tone for a lot of a lot of what's going to happen after that. So, so spend the time, 
uh, recognizing and giving feedback. I don't want to, I don't want to just say it's just all just the happy stuff. There are things you want to, you, you, you are not happy about or, or concerned about. Those are also the time to address it and not be shy about that. That's, that's setting the future, right? Yeah, look, and I've made that mistake, right? Uh, I think in the past, I felt like I really want to make sure that we're celebrating this new, this new hire. And I think we do that, but I also got some great feedback by a new hire who was like, hey, Joe, you're doing a great job telling me all the good stuff, but I also need to know where I need to improve. Like I want to come, I, I want to be amazing. And so, you know, don't just point out the things that I'm doing really well. I'd love to get some feedback around the things that you want me doing better. And I thought that was amazing uh, feedback that I received from, you know, someone who was reporting up to me. So Quasi, one thing I think about when it comes to common reasons that a new hire doesn't work out is sort of this concept of bait and switch. So how open and honest are companies being with candidates around things that are ultimately going to matter to them, right? Expectations during their first week, their first month, their first three months, their first 12 months. Here at Gusto, I tip my cap to our people team who have really put a tremendous amount of thought and effort into being as transparent as we possibly can in our job postings. And this has been really amazing at helping us, one, to attract really wonderful candidates, and two, when we go at and, and land that candidate, there aren't a whole lot of surprises, which is a good thing. The bait and switch is it's hard. It's hard because it can happen both sides. Then whether it's the employee over like overstating what they have done and can do, or whether it's the a company overstating what they're going to be able to do and the the freedom or the influence that they're going to have, right? Both of them are problematic, and and, I, and that's you know during that interviewing phase. I think as an employer, you're trying to really dig in to see, you know, make sure the person has the skills and the experience to do what you want them to do so that you don't have that bait and switch. And as the employee or the potential employee, you know, that's hard to do, but you, the more you can dig into the job to really understand the what you're going to be able to do the job and have the tools and the resources and then support to do the job you're, you're signing up to do, the better, you know, the, the less chance of that bait and switch happening. But I think that, you know, both take an incredible amount of confidence and, and, and the initiative to, to ask those questions in interviews, right? Because you're trying to get a job. I want this job. Such a strange thing, eh? The interview process. It, it, it is. Honestly, it's, it's the most interest. It's the most, um, interestingly weird. And I think flawed process in the corporation, in most corporations, like you talk to someone for an hour and maybe you have them come back and talk to somebody else for an hour. Maybe they come back and talk to somebody else for half an hour. And we decide you're worth X thousands of dollars a year. We're committed. We're signing up. And it's like, it, it, and the, the person signing up has no idea what it's like to even enter those doors. Like, it's just, it, it, it boggles my mind, right? Like most people have a harder time getting dates to second date than they do getting a job in the current world. Like, it's just, doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> it is a bit broken. It is a bit, a bit broken. broken. Okay. So if your plans change and it impacts a new hire's role. How do you smooth this over over time? Yeah, I've I've had this in the past where but we where the role we thought we were hiring changed drastically or the or something we thought we were hiring for and we decide we're not doing that business anymore. And so that role changes. And so if the you know first transparency with the candidate, understanding what has changed. And so I I've, I've, I can think of one in particular, the role just didn't make sense for the candidate anymore. And we had to we didn't bring the candidate in because the role had changed so drastically that it wasn't right for the candidate anymore. And it was a mutual conversation. It was painful, but the right thing to do at the time. I've also had to change the situation where we, we brought the candidate and told them the role is changing. And the candidate thought they still had the skill. We thought they still had the skill to do the role. And, we, and the person started and was, was successful. I don't think you can bring people in and to play, to change their roles in the, in the first, I think you owe people the first few months of what you committed to in the interview process. That's my own view. Uh, and maybe people may disagree with that. And if you can't do that, then be transparent with the candidate. If you can, then then do that and then change it over time. But I don't think you should be, you know, uh, for me, you're, you're playing with someone's life, career, days of their, of their, of their working that they can be finding something else. Just be transparent. I don't have the role or the role has changed, or we're going to stick with this role for the next three months, but it's likely going to look like this at the end of it. I, I think that's what we owe people. The strong opinion on that one. <laughs> I like it. I think that's a good, a good, good, strong opinion. I, I, I share it. Okay. At the other end of the spectrum, what tips can you offer for addressing a new hire who doesn't live up to expectations? Yeah, this is 
no, I don't know many people who do this well because, you know, as we've talked about in this conversation, we want to recognize, we want to encourage, we want to do all that good stuff that, that to keep them and get them going, right? But at the same time, during that time, you also have to protect against the fact that they may not be the right person, right? And they may, and so whether that is taking notes or giving feedback or, 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 or doing all the things that may, you know, let's just say at the end of the three months, they can be great and they're flying. Whether the end of the three months, they might be the wrong person, you might need to, to part ways. During that three months, you have to be paying attention to both enough to be able to have that decision at the end, right? Or at that, whatever that time is. I'm saying three months because of typical probation, but that could have been any time period. Um, so in the early, st in the early stages, if things aren't going well, the feedback to the employee is important. Documenting the feedback is an HR person. I'll tell you, documenting the feedback is probably more important than actually giving the feedback. We need to do both. Um, because it, often, you know, things can get better, but often if the, if things are, are not going well or they're going really poorly in the first period, that's the best you're getting from people often. That's their, they're coming to work to put their best foot forward. They are putting on their their best. It's a new place, new colleagues, et cetera. And if that's the time where you can't get, you know, you can't give feedback and get them to improve or they are just way off, then that's really hard to recover from. And are you quick to part ways with somebody that after two, three months, they are just clearly not living up to expectations? Or are you going to kind of stick with that person and, and do everything you can to support them and nurture them with with the hopes that they become sort of the the person and contributor that you that you hope they would be i was going to figure out how to say this without using like a trigger analogy because it sounds bad in this situation but the decision can't be easy and quick but once the decision's made take the action right and so for me it isn't so much that you're quick to part ways like that should be a well thought out you know somewhat timely decisions because you're you know you probably still have a warm talent pool that's still there. You probably still have, you haven't disrupted the team yet. They haven't you know, planted roots in the team. They haven't, there are other reasons to make a a timely decision, but not, but what I just want to make, make people think that I don't want to make it a quick decision. Let's make a timely decision. And this is probably the right time to make the decision and then take action. But I don't think you should be quick to fire anyone. I think you, you've you invested the time, make sure it's the right decision, think it through, discuss it. You know, you know, make sure it's the right decision. But once you've made the decision, let's not drag it out. Let's make the decision and then and take action. Yeah, it's a t it's a really it's a it's a tough one, right? And I've also been on the other side where, you know, I think all the signs were there early that this person just wasn't right for the role, and we probably stuck it out way too long, and uh, at the expense of you know teammates that want to work with people that are high performers and at the expense of the program that we were trying to get off the ground that wasn't performing. Um, so it's a real, it, this is a real tough one, right? Where you, but it's not always cut and dry, right? This is for me, I really go to bat for making the decision to treat the candidate. Well, like I know what you've got legally written out in paper and I know a private probation period you can walk away from and all the other good stuff. Yeah. But if the decision is, is, you know, and, and you take some responsibility as a company, the decision didn't work out, then treat the candidate well. Yes, it may cost you a week or two weeks or whatever you decide is well or a month. Do whatever you want to be. That, some people just freaked out when I said a month. But you do treat the candidate, the person well in that exit if you make that decision. But make the decision that's right for the company. If you want to build a culture that people won't want to leave, check out Culture is the Ultimate Advantage our free guide to turning your culture into your company's greatest strength. Click the link in the description to get your copy. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please hit that like button and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And don't forget to recognize someone for a job well done today. Mucho gusto.